you left EXP, you joined Real. What caused you to do it? There's a lot, man. What was their issue with the videos that they didn't like? Certain things that I was saying was upsetting people, but it was definitely more of a personal thing. They don't want me speaking about those things. Fair enough. Then I'll take my business elsewhere. Did you put things in place to make sure that you don't find yourself in a similar situation? I never roll everything into that one basket. Was it worth it to uh, share your deep rooted beliefs, knowing what you know now? Appreciate you jumping on the podcast with us this morning. Thank you for having me, Brandon. I'm um, excited to be here, man. Luckily, I've been battling to get my voice back the last couple of days, so it sounds like we're okay. Yeah, yeah. And listen, I uh, like I was just telling you off air. I mean, I've been um, truly, truly a big fan of your work for a long time. You've been you've been at this for a long time, and you just recently made some big moves. Left EXP, joined Real. We're gonna unpack that in just a second. But first, I want to talk about the cloud-based brokerage model. And there's a ton of ups, upside, downside, pros, cons. And in a lot of ways, Brian, I think the, the model truly is genius. And I'm curious to find out, you know, what, what had you go that direction with your business? And then we'll kind of talk more about uh, some other things. Yeah. So originally when I joined EXP, you know, we really have to give them the credit for pioneering that type of model. Um, I said, look, I'm in a position in my business where, you know, I have my team. I know what I'm doing. I don't necessarily just rely on a brokerage, like maybe a new agent who's going to be running around asking questions and really feels like they, they need somebody there 24 seven. So I said, I basically just need a brokerage to get out of my way. And when I looked at the models, I said, look, I'm at a point where my business is running. I'm doing my thing. When I looked at the cloud-based model and what they were offering compared to what I was with currently, it just made sense. You know, the timing of it, which is huge, which we can talk about later as well. Um, the revenue share aspect was fantastic, even though with EXP, I took more of a passive approach with that because it wasn't really a focus compared to what it is now with, with real brokerage now that I moved. Um, the stock options, you know, the equity options in the company were amazing. And I ended up accumulating a ton of stock with EXP over the years, just with the production, with my team and myself. So when you looked at it as a whole, I said, man, you know, I get to contribute to the company that I'm a part of now as an agent. And it's cool because I get rewarded for my performance. I get rewarded for bringing people to the company. Overall, I think it just really changed the game in regards to agents joining companies, you know, and yeah. we, we're, we're at a, I, th I think we hit a crossroads a while back where you know, I got into the business about 10 years ago and a lot of what I was sharing, man, was stuff that I was learning on my own, you know? So the game changed when I got into real estate, I couldn't go to YouTube to get help. Now you can. And I would get messages from companies even years ago. They're like, dude, we use your free YouTube content to train our agents. And I thought that was really cool. Yet at the same time, kind of pathetic. I said, man, they don't really offer any training. So now I think we have shifted in a way where, where people used to rely on the broker for resources or training. You can go to YouTube or go somewhere else now. And even if you look at old content, you can get a lot. Like I get messages from people saying they built their business just with some of my old playlists. And I think it's incredible if you're resourceful as a person. So now instead of somebody just requiring from the, the brokerage, hey, I need help, I need support, you can get some, but people are looking for something additional to that. And I think that's where this cloud-based type of model and brokerage came in and really just you know went full steam ahead and changed the game for sure. Yeah, there's no doubt, right? And so uh, in my career, I, I, you know, hindsight's always 2020. I took a, a more of a traditional path and I'll share some stuff on this podcast that probably I've never shared before. Let me turn this down just so I don't, I'm not too, too loud, but, um, I'll probably share some things, Brian, with with you and the audience that I haven't shared publicly yet with anybody. And that is that I, I grew a traditional brokerage. And the challenge with that, as you know, uh, growing your local team when you were with Keller Williams, is you 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 have a local pool of talent to mm -hmm. to grow with. And yeah. the thing I love most about the cloud-based brokerage is when I looked at the model you know, and I have looked deeply into both EXP and real to me, I'm like, wow. I mean, there's no better platform 
to to monetize um, leadership, we'll call it. There's no better monetization in re the real estate space than these uh, opportunities, whether it be growing a team, growing a company, uh, monetizing through education, coaching and courses. There's nothing better than this model. Uh, what was it when, when you said to yourself, all right, I'm going to go and do this. Is that kind of what you were thinking to say, dude, I can have a global team, not have to worry about brick and mortar, not to worry about licenses, not have to worry about any of that stuff. Cause that's certainly some of the things I've thought about. I mean, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I looked at it from that perspective for sure, because even in the inception of creating my business way back in the day, I would tell, you know, Lloyda, who was working with me at the time, um, as I was starting to build my team and even the people close to me, I said, man, I eventually want to take my brand and team BC like nationwide or worldwide because yeah, social media facilitates that, but I, I want to grow this thing. People are too like small minded. You know? So that seed was always there. And when I looked at the brokerage, as I started learning more, and then we fast forward to 2020, when I decided to go nationwide, everything was just facilitated. Because on top of that, even though I was passive, you do have the capability, whether through social media or however else you want to do it, you can grow. Even with people who don't join your team necessarily, you can grow an agent network. And I think that's one of the, the other bonuses to this cloud based model is now that's really what you're selling is the network. People have access to us. We have our own platform. We do additional meetups and masterminds. Like it's really cool for somebody to join now and have access to your people, your network, your resources, just because they joined the company and they joined under you. So from a, a team standpoint, but also just the agent network standpoint, I definitely saw the, the potential in it. And when I look to the future, we had this whole shutdown, you know, two and a half years ago, well, the cloud-based brokerage was already ready. All the resources were already online. They had the, you know, the little EXP world for us to go on. Everything was already virtual. We were used to doing everything on Zoom. So that transition to having to do everything virtually had already been done. And I think it just exposed one of the potential weaknesses of a traditional, you know, retail brokerage is, hey, if something like this outside of our control happens, are we ready and at capacity to keep serving and adjust? Or are we going to go through a two or three month period to figure this thing out? Because I had so many agents reaching out to me. How do you use Zoom and how do you go virtual? I was like, man, I've been telling you guys for 10 years now to start utilizing video and get used to this whole online thing because it's coming and it's not going away. And they still resisted it until that moment where they had to adapt. So yeah. seeing that, I think, really made it obvious to people like, OK, this is the future for sure. Yeah, 100 percent. And to, to that point. The, the, I experienced the exact same thing. Here, here's what happened to me is I grew a traditional brokerage, Brian. We got it up to about 275 agents. I haven't shared this necessarily publicly to too many people, but I sold my, I sold my company. And um, the reason for that is exactly what you just said. So I started on YouTube in 2017 um, after watching a lot of your content. You know, truth be told, I'm like, this makes a lot of sense. I can spread my message all over the country, all over the world through video and not just locally here in Detroit. And here's what happened over the past four or five years. My education business now has served 6,000 realtors all over the world as a result of YouTube. I can never have 6,000 agents in Detroit. And the problem with that is as people were like, well, you should open a company here and you should do that is licensing and compliance and uh, brick and mortar and all this stuff. When you look at the crowd, uh, the cloud based brokerage model, you can set up shop overnight in all 50 states and start building whether they on your team or an agent network to your point and start serving agents in, in a much better way and not have to be the broker. And I think that's kind of what you've experienced. Is that right? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, there's no red tape, right? There's no overhead. There's no liability that you would Phenomenal. have from a traditional brokerage. So hundred percent, man, it just, it makes sense. You know, you, you, you look at the model and you want to try to find holes in it and it, it gets increasingly more difficult. The more you, you look into it, the more you research it. It's interesting. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of pros to it. I just, I want to spend just a second talking about some potential downsides to it that I've seen. Not, not holes in the model per se, but the way this is just, the lens in which I look through in working with so many agents is that I think maybe you can argue 
that the worst thing for a new real estate agent is putting them by themselves without anybody around in their basement, in their underwear, and think that they're going to succeed by themselves. It's probably the worst thing. And yeah. it's maybe when I look at that model for a, for a, for the new guy, not, not guys like you and I have been doing this for 15, 17 years. I'm talking about Bob who just gets his license. My belief is he probably needs to have some, some, hands-on support around him potentially because yeah. you get that guy by himself he's going to take the path of least resistance yeah. do you agree do you disagree how do you help agents succeed in a cloud-based environment where, where they have no environment yeah you know it's, it's a great observation and, and and that's something i struggled with in the beginning because even though i had some support i still realized early on and maybe this is because of my athletic background you know professional sports and all that Dude, I'm just a competitor, and if I want something, I'm gonna go get it. So whether you give me support or not, I'm gonna figure it out. And prior to the real estate industry specifically, I was naive enough to think that, well, everybody, even if they're not that way now, they can activate that. I thought everybody just had that potential. And I still, to a degree, believe that people do. However, certain individuals are gonna be a lot more resourceful and go that extra mile, right? Which is kind of that entrepreneur seed, whatever we want to call it, right? Other people, yes, are going to be a little bit more hesitant and require that somebody be in their corner or be readily accessible to them. And I think just having that safety net in their mind of saying, hey, I have my broker here next to me. I can walk to his office. I can drive to the location and, and you know, go to this office and, and be with my peers and be in a different environment. I think not only is that appealing for certain people, in a way, it may be required because not everybody's going to be the, the the solo beast that comes in and just starts wrecking everything and getting a bunch of deals and they're self-sustaining. They can be on their own island. Again, I was naive enough to think everybody could do that and everybody wanted to do that, but some people don't. Some people look at real estate as a part-time endeavor. Some people That's just right. want to join a team, funnel in some deals, provide for their family, do six, seven, eight deals or even less a year put food on the table and they're satisfied. So I think depending on, on the type of person that you're getting, then yes, absolutely. There could be a hole in it and having that kind of retail space is good. That's why like on my end, I have two office locations here in Miami. One of them as a benefit to people, especially newer agents, I offer them that space and say, Hey, part of the, the benefits package of joining with us is I have a local space here that you can use as a workspace to meet with clients, to make calls and we leave it open and exclusively available for that reason because I was looking just like you at the potential cons and saying, if we can patch this thing up or make it better, what are some things we can do to kind of, you know, even that out and make sure that it's just this complete package that is really, really beneficial for everybody. Yeah, it's phenomenal because I think you and I both would agree when it comes to human performance and that's the world you come from. I think at the top of that chart, it's gotta be accountability, right? And it doesn't matter the, the person's talent. It's because we're humans, our innate biology uh, mm -hmm. puts us in a position to take the path of least resistance. Right. So put, put a great human being in, in a world where they have high levels of accountability, they're going to win. They're going to want to win. They're going to want to outperform people that are around them uh, versus just putting them by themselves. And what you just said is, 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 is so cool in that you have space for folks. When I thought about that, Brian, I thought about doing something like this, and I don't know if you've, you've, I'm sure you have, but I thought about a world where we can create an environment for these people that is still virtual, but they're not alone. So creating a world where we have a, a running Zoom, so to speak, and we're all prospecting together, you're checking in, you're posting your numbers throughout the day. Is that something you guys do uh, uh, in your group at all? Yeah. You know, and we're still building it out. Like that's something I originally implemented a lot with my private groups and my coaching years ago and people loved it. Um, now we're extending it like uh, two of my friends. It's not official yet, so I'm not announcing it. Right. Uh, two of my good friends that I'm bringing over from California that are big producers. We're going to create our own little mastermind for real specifically uh, where we do have these open Zoom calls, you know, weekly calls, private group, because we do want to provide that environment for people where we are attracting people from like you're in Michigan you know, Illinois, I had somebody reach out from North Dakota and maybe locally what we just described previously, they can't find that even if they want it. 
And that was a pred predicament that I was in when I started. I said, man, I can't find other people that are on this wavelength that I am even at a great office. So can I find this virtually? And hundred percent, I think that's key because moving forward, especially with the way the world is going, that's almost going to have to be a necessity because a 1, lot of thousand percent. Yeah. They, they're, it's going to have to be virtual. And again, you're either going to adapt or you're going to be left behind. So I guess that final kind of bridge, uh, you know, gap that we need to bridge is can we get as many people as possible to take that step? Because you know, man, you've been in this world now for a while, getting people to take that step willingly and engage is always the toughest part. Like yeah. sometimes I've even brought in people to my team and, you know, I'll end up letting them go. I'm like, dude, we gave you everything. All you had to do was engage and step up. I can't do that for you. Like you, you, you come in with these aspirations and these goals. And I see a lot of agents do that, but when it's time for them to take that step and say, okay, I need to join the zoom. I need to be a part of these meetings. I need to step up. They don't do it. And that's that thing that's been racking my brain, bro, for years. How can I, if possible, like project myself into that person and get them to walk forward? Cause sometimes so that true. last step, yeah, it, it's just insane, dude. Like, and it blows my mind. It really does. Well, and, and to that point, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. There's not, we don't have, a, in our industry of real estate sales, as you know, we don't have a problem with desire. Everybody comes in the business thinking they're going to be do this and do that. And I want this. I want that. I'm like, yeah, I know. But what makes you different? Because so does everybody else. Everybody else wants to make a lot of money. Everybody else wants a Ferrari. They want the big house. They want to, I, I get it. Everybody says that the reality is, you know, as soon as it is time for them to show up to do the work, they go into the witness protection program. It's like, Bob, I thought you, I thought you said you wanted to, what, what happened to that Rolex that was on the vision board? Yeah, that's not so important anymore. Oh, I got it. I got it. Right. So it's, it's the problem is in my opinion is four numbers, 1099. As soon as you put somebody in a 1099 independent contractor role, they lose that accountability that they had at their W-2 job, which they're trying to run away from, which was the best thing for them. That's a whole nother podcast you and I could do is what, what would be really cool to see is if we W-2 new realtors for their first two or three years until they had the habits, the behaviors, they got a salary, and then they graduated yep. to be their own business owner. That'd be interesting to see. Thoughts on that? It's, it's, it's interesting because what you just described is something I would tell realtors. So as a way of, of testing what you just said, I've been doing this for years. I would tell them, look, what if I guaranteed you that your first year you would make X amount, 150, 200,000, but this is what you had to do. And then literally what I do is I itemize every single thing that I did in every hour that I put in my first year. And I ask them, would you do it? And they're like, absolutely. I said, great, then get to work. Cause that's exactly what I did my first year and I yeah. earned that much money. But the moment that realization comes in again, that they're going to be 1099, it's like, well, all of a sudden it's not guaranteed and all these stories and all these hesitations come out. And I'm just like, dude, you literally just agreed to it. And now all of a sudden yeah. it doesn't work. Like, give me a break. It's so funny. Right. And so, uh, to, to put a bow on that conversation, we'll, we'll unpack something else. You know, my whole thing is I have this, this approach that I, that I coach to, and we call it the daily 30, right? If you have 30 conversations a day, 240 times, that's 7,200 conversations a year. If you do that, you can't help but win. And so to your yeah. point, what, what I've done is I said to, to Bob, I always call everybody Bob or Sue. Uh, I told Bob, I said, Bob, listen, I know your goal is to make 150,000. All you have to do is 7,200 conversations. So if we split that into 240 working days, it's 30 conversations a day. So if we take the $150,000 and we divide that by 7,200 conversations, it's 20 bucks every time you make a contact. And here's what we'll do. I will write you the check today for the 150. I'll put the 150 in your checking account, Bob. And every day you don't have 30 conversations, I deduct $20. Mm -hmm. And let's see how much you're, you end up with at the end of the year. And they always end up with nothing because they never make the 30 contacts yeah. a day. 100%. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's that simple. Yeah, it is that simple. Just really hard for people to do. All right. So you recently uh, made a huge move. You, you left EXP. You joined Real. I'd love to really get into this and, and unpack this. What caused you to do it? Uh, there's a lot, man. Uh, yep. One was timing. You know, when I joined EXP, I didn't join at the same time as I'm joining Real. 
So timing is, is a huge issue and sometimes opportunity. Like how many people wish they could have bought Bitcoin, you know, 10 years ago, right? Uh, they're, they're, they wish they could go in a time travel machine and go back 10 years and, and get a couple. Uh, that was a big one. Number two is I was having uh, an issue in regards to social media and content. Um, I was being requested basically to make some changes, remove certain posts, not talk about certain things. And it just, it didn't align with my, my, my code, you know? Um, and when I walked away, I was making very good money with the revenue share. I built that up passively, but I, I told people it, it's not a money thing. You know, if like our values don't align and the culture isn't what I want and that shifted, then I'm gonna go somewhere else. And, and that was that was what opened the door to the move was that. Like it was just a direct clash, you know, in regards to what I wanted to do. Um, and people always ask like, oh, what are the details? Well, I basically got requested to change five or six things, delete some posts, go back and remove some, you know, older videos. And it just didn't make any sense to me to be hit from left field with this request. Um, I have my theories as to why that happened, but that was kind of the precursor to the move. So we have that. We have the timing for sure. Number three, I said, man, this is a great opportunity for me now to take the network building aspect of it. Because when I walk into a room, I have a lot that I can offer people. Like, I, you know, this last week I've been traveling a lot and speaking. I can get in front of somebody and I can now pitch them real. I can pitch them to join my team, right? I can pitch them to get on my coaching or some of my courses. So opportunities keep infinitely increasing. And I saw real as a way for me to say, okay, since I'm already building my team and doing these things and speaking so much, why not have something that I can offer that's nice and switch from being more passive like I was with eXp to now being more active. So now I'm actively building the network. And I mean, I've only been with the company two months or a little bit more, and I think I already have over a hundred people in my network. I brought over some big teams, it's right? Phenomenal. I'm bringing over a couple of my friends and we're working on bringing over their whole brokerage of almost 200 agents. So, you know, this thing is moving, but all they did was it flipped the switch from passive to active. Cause sure. I think over the last four or five years I've been with EXP, I made maybe a handful of videos about it. Yeah. You've right? been, like, you, you were quiet. You were quiet yeah. about it. Yeah. And, and at one point I was bringing in 50, 60 new people to EXP a month. You sure. know, and I think for a while, that first line, I was like top of the company for a very long time until people really started going hard with the recruiting. But I did, again, I did that passively. And that was a good business. It was making me a lot of money. But I look at like the potential and I share this with people. I say, look, with what I'm doing with real, just with the network, I want to turn that into a seven figure business in 12, 12 to 18 months. And I know I can do it. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the vision that I sell to a lot of the people that are coming and the people that are contacting me are broker owners, team leaders. You know, uh, I'm getting some new agents, but the, the, the pool of people contacting me about real is completely 180 degree turn and difference from, you know, EXP. Uh, yeah. But I would say those are the three main things. And the last one was just my team structure. You know, when I was with EXP, I had to have outside contracts drafted up by my lawyer and I had to have those agreements, agreements in place to run my team the way that I ran it because I don't do it traditionally per se, the way I run my team. I, I like to do things a little bit differently with real. They basically asked me, okay, give us a roster, give us your structure and we'll honor it. And I thought that was fantastic because before I made the move, I was able to sit down with, you know, the vice president, Sheila, I was able to talk to the CEO, Tamir, and I was able to have phone and zoom conversations with the leadership before moving over. And they're asking me questions and asking me for feedback before I even joined the company. So to me, that culture of collaboration is key. Because if you have people like myself who buy into the vision and the culture of the company, we can be your front runners for helping you grow, you know? And, and I just, even though EXP was great, and I don't really have anything bad to say about EXP, this is just something a little bit different that I'm really enjoying. And maybe it's because they are smaller and newer, uh, but it's just, it, it really has been enjoyable. And, and to have access to the leadership and corporate on my phone or ask them to jump on a Zoom and they'll do it. And to see them sharing my stuff on social media, it's just night and day different. And I, you know, it's just something that I'm really, 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 really enjoying. Yeah. Uh, well said. And, and thank you for, for all of that, because I've had some really nice meetings with Tamir myself and, um, the, the recent move of Sharon going over there now as, as president of real, I think is a great move. And, yeah. you know, I, I just, I haven't had, um, any bad experiences with, with, with EXP either, you know, in, in, in my meetings and whatnot, 
I just, to me, from an outsider's perspective, I'm not with EXP, I'm not with real. To me, it just seems as though you use the word uh, a collaborative culture is what real's leadership is all about from the standpoint of, you know, you talk about content, right? And, and that was always my worry is with these companies, I said, guys, my my platform is social media. The way in which I grow everything is through social media. My concern is that, you know, I I make an alignment with one of you the these companies, and then all of all of a sudden you want to you want to control the flow of content. And it sounds as though that was something what happened at EXP. You don't have to get into details, but like, yeah. was it was it around how you were positioning recruiting at EXP or, or can you give us, what can you give us as like, what, what was their issue with the videos that they, that they didn't like? Well, um, it, it was more a personal thing, you know, um, I'm, I've always okay. been pretty outspoken about things and yes, how I have, am yeah. is how, yeah, how I am is how I am. And again, you're good to like it or not like it, but you know, uh, I guess certain things that I was saying, was upsetting people, but it was definitely more of a personal thing. I don't think it, it ever had anything to do with being in violation of like the NAR code of ethics because I've never done that ever or come even close to it. It wasn't transactional. Uh, it wasn't with my recruiting, you know. And and to your previous point, I was what I didn't understand that some people did is I never put all my eggs in that EXP basket. Like I've kept Team BC, BC, my coaching and everything that I offer completely separate of the platform while a lot of people just roll it into it and say, hey, this is just with EXP. So um, that that's something from my business model that I did differently compared to other people. As I said, I'm not just gonna give this to people if they join EXP, like this is this is my own creation. This is my own system. This is my own you know, business. Why would I just roll it into something else? So it was never, it was never about that. Um, it was just more personal stuff, you know? Like, you know, I've been outspoken. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give my opinion on things. You know, when I was back in LA, uh, back in 2020, I was locked up in my home. I felt like in a cage and I was outspoken about it. And that's really what started the downfall of my social media in regards to being demonetized, you yeah. know, having my Facebook deleted. My Instagram mm -hmm. is, is, is running on fumes at this point. I think in 24 hours, man, there's 24 hours where I get less than 100 story views. And I have, I've been stuck at 41,000 followers for years. It's been three or four years now. So, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and whatever that ship sailed, I kind of knew that would happen being outspoken about things, but it was really a personal thing that, that they had a problem with. And they claimed it was complaints that they were getting. Hmm. And I remember meeting with them on the cloud, some of the leadership. And I said, I know from day one, you guys have been getting complaints about me. I know why now, four or five years later, is this an issue when I was more outspoken three, two, three, four years ago, and it was never a problem then. Why is it a problem now? So the the theory that I kind of crafted was maybe I wasn't bringing as many people now to the company. So it was like, should we the deal with it? The chicken or the egg, right? Yeah, it was, it was like, yep. is the juice worth the squeeze? Yeah. We're dealing with all this stuff. If you're bringing something yep. to the table, yeah. Interesting, interesting. That's just a theory. You know, it's just yeah, a yeah, theory. Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, um, most of my dealings with EXP have been positive. So I'm not sitting here bashing them. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I just think it was, it was an alignment thing, you know? And if they shifted and... Uh, they don't want me speaking about those things. Fair enough. Then I'll take my business elsewhere. It's, it's really not a problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's deep. I mean, that's heavy. And um, I give you so much credit, Brian, truly for having the courage to be transparent around a belief system before money. When I saw your video about that specifically, I'm like, that's when I reached out to you on Instagram. I'm like, dude, let's have this conversation because to me, that's true leadership. True yeah. leadership was, and you don't have to disclose how much you were making at EXP or your rev share. It doesn't matter. What matters yeah. is you put your belief system before your profits. That says so much yeah. about who you are as, as a person. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that don't know you, I mean, that to me, I was like, wow. I mean, that, that is huge. Cause a lot of people, um, I'll try to keep this clean. You know, they, <laughs> they, they, they will, they will do a lot of things for money that Absolutely. you, that you will not, that you won't yeah. bend on a belief system, yeah. no matter the money. Yeah. It's, it's a multiple six figure, multiple six figure a year business. Okay. You know, there was months where I would make over 30,000 off the revenue share. Right. And that wasn't consistently, sure. but multiple six figure a year business. But like, I, like I mentioned to you or anybody else and my team specifically, 
and even people that I'm recruiting or anybody else I'm talking to, I'm like, it's not about the money, man. Like if you can't stand on your core values, you don't have a business and, and you really don't have that true solid character. And that's I right. think that's been one of the fundamental principles that has allowed me to last throughout the years, whether being censored or not, whether it's with my team, my brand, or anything else. It's just, I mean, it, it's moments like this where people really see, okay, is this dude really who he says he is, right? Because, yep. I mean, that, that was a nice automatic you know, payment to get every month. But again, the money can be made again. Like I know within a couple months, I'll already meet that and surpass it with real. It's Absolutely. not about the money. It's not about the money. You know, and, and a lot of people miss that. They'll compromise themselves at a character level, at an internal level with their values and beliefs for money. Now you're playing into that agenda of a lot of the issues that I have with phones and social media is people paint this picture. Oh, I'm this good guy. But behind the scenes, they're not. But people will believe it. And, and that's happened to me over the years where people will attack me because, oh, this guy is better, a better person than you. And then when these type of situations happen, that individual ends up selling out and I don't. And then people are left scratching their heads like, mm, interesting. What went, what, what was going on here? We thought Brian would sell out. <laughs> yeah, no, man, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, again, I give you a lot of credit, a lot mm. of credit. Um, did you have a conversation with the leadership team at real to make sure that, you know, you're not in, in, in a similar situation in a couple of years, like guys, listen, mm -hmm. I'm outspoken. This is who I am. Uh, yeah. I, I make a lot of content. Like, were you, were you certain? Did you put things in place to make sure that you don't find yourself in a similar situation? Absolutely. You know, 100%. I had multiple conversations with them. Um, and really, it boiled down to this. They said, as long as you're not in direct violation of the NAR code of ethics, you're good. Because we know we're going to get complaints. A good friend of mine, Colton Lindsay, right? He helped launch Utah for real. Um, same thing, right? He originally, I think, could not join EXP because right. he had an issue with somebody in Utah and they were saying, well, he's too outspoken or we don't, he doesn't fit with the culture. So once they added him and then I had a, a, a meeting actually with him and some of the leadership initially, it really gave me that vote of confidence because I said, look, if he's been with the company a year and a half, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a lot more inclined to believe what they're telling me because there's already somebody here who's tested that theory and that information prior to me stepping in now. So um, when, when I took a look at it from the outside after multiple conversations, it made sense because uh, I did hit a crossroads myself. Why not open up my own brokerage? Right. And then, I, and then kind of what you brought up earlier about the liability and all that. And I said, man, and how am I going to replicate revenue share and stock? That's just not an opportunity that, you know, I can really create unless I do a ton of research and probably put a ton of money into it. And like, it's just going to be this whole other like Mount Everest that I have to climb when I can kind of tap into it. But to, to add to that point, just like with EXP, you know, if real doesn't work out, I'm good. Like I never like like this is the the main thing that I tell people. I never roll everything into that one basket. I'm betting on real, and there's a tremendous upside. If it doesn't work out, I'm still good. I can walk away, wipe my hands clean, and keep going. Right? I'm never gonna put everything to ride. Like the guy that goes to Vegas and puts ten grand on you know rolling the dice, or he goes and he plays roulette. I'm gonna put all my life savings on red. I'll never do that because I'm, I'm way too tactical to do that. So is real fantastic? Yeah. Could we have an issue in the future? I don't know, right? I don't have the crystal ball. But all I know is what I'm doing with them and, and, and helping build, at the end of the day, if I have to step away, I'm still going to be whole, intact. I'm still going to have my business and life will go on. Well said. Yeah, man, that's great. Um, if you could go back, would you would you reconsider... This is interesting. I think about this a lot. W would you go back and be as open about your beliefs as you have been, be as outspoken as you have been over the past couple of years on your beliefs, knowing the downside? Was it worth it to uh, share your deep rooted beliefs, knowing what you know now? I'm just kind of curious what your position is on that. Yes, 100%. Right. Um, I always tell people we have to stand uh, for what's right, you know, and, and at the same time. Right. And this is the I think the side of the coin that people don't see. I could be in a room or on a live like this or a virtual, you know, Zoom webinar, anything where I have somebody sitting across from me who is the exact opposite in their belief system. Yet what happened to me, I would never do to them. 
I would never deplatform them. I would never demonetize them, yeah. right? I would allow them to do what they do. Just like I come across people who don't agree with me all the time. That's fine. But hey, dude, that, 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 that's our uh, innate right as human beings is we're all individuals. We're going to disagree. Even yeah. if we agree on 99% of stuff, I guarantee you I can find something like your favorite color is red and I hate red, right? As an example, we're always going to find something. Uh, but to me, when I, when I look at everything I've built, a lot of my most loyal team members, customers, whatever you want to call it, right? Social media followers, I know we're there and we have that connection because of what you just asked me because yeah. they know my character and it comes out, right? And also I think that unconsciously gives other people permission to do the same. Yeah. And when we start changing at the individual level, that's what creates that ripple effect for everybody to have that freedom and start to, to do that more. So um, 100%, I, I, I would do it again. Because again, it, it goes back to money. We can always make more money. You know, me and you, we don't have problems making money. Right. You could take everything away from me and I'll build up my businesses again in probably 12 months, maybe 24 months max and be making the same money I'm making now. So um, I just think that that's a tool. And I think a lot of people, when they look at this position, we're looking at it from a different perspective. We're not looking at it from the normal mentality where we're stressed and anxious about money. We've never had it. And we can't even imagine not being able to make like a rental payment or, or our house payment, right? We've made enough money and I've made enough money to where... Like that's, that's completely out of my mind. So we step into a realm now and an experience of life that's different than most people. Because if I ask that question to 100 people, 99 or 100 can't even conceptualize that. because they've never been in, Yeah, they've never been in that, that position financially. So that's always like in the back of their mind, a stress, a worry. Yeah. Conversations come up about money. They start backing away because they're a little bit insecure about it. They won't look at their bank account because they're embarrassed. I mean, I've been there. I've been there, right? Sure. That's why I bring up those specific examples. But it, it's just different. So for me, I would never have that balancing act like, oh man, stay true to my character or oh, I need the five grand a month. Without a question, it's like, I'm going to stand true to my character. No problem. Because when we look back at the ancient times, that's what really caused the, the, the positive ripple effects that we needed is when people finally stood up and said, no, enough with this nonsense or no. We, we stand for this and we stand by it and we're willing to fight for it. And I just, I totally identify with, with that culture and that mentality. And I think that's why I've just become in a way on social media to a degree, a living embodiment of that. Cause when I, when I watch even those movies or read the books about it, I'm just, I'm fascinated by that. I'm like, dude, what would I have done back then? I could see myself being this guy and going one after a hundred because I feel like that now in a way where. I got the bullseye on my back, like, oh, he's the bad guy when I'm really not. I'm, I'm getting all these messages. And, and to add to it, dude, I've gotten so many messages, emails, like everything, conversations in person. Even here in Miami, I get stopped like every other day. Dude, I appreciate you standing for what you stand for. I appreciate you voicing you know, your beliefs because it goes to show that you know, there's still people out there that think like me. And I get messages like this all the time, which is good because I think it helps those individuals. And whether it's this or anything else, it's, I believe, helpful for more people, at least for the people who would be your tribe and the people who would be positively impacted by what you do 100%. Absolutely. I mean, dude, you, you, you and I are so philosophically aligned with that. Again, you're right. It's what had me reach out to you was because of that stance to be true to yourself and what you believe in. And because so many people are getting deplatformed right now, because they said the wrong thing. And on, on interviews, they go back and say, oh, I don't know if I would have done that again, you know? And it's like, that's why I asked you. I'm just, I was curious. Um, and it wasn't to, to, to test you. It was, I was genuinely curious kind of going through what you've gone through. Um, because the thing that you hit on Brian is I wish that the world could be more open-minded to this, which is the value of content, the value of conversation is disagreement. Yeah. That is yeah. like, like there's, there's nothing better. It's, it's just when two people can disagree on something and have a healthy conversation about it is, yeah. is what the value is in a conversation. And the fact is, yeah, with the agenda of people, if you don't believe in what they believe in, you get deplatformed. It's, it's insane. It is. And I mean, I, I look at sales. My, yeah. my most magnificent presentations were solely started with 
big disagreements or strong disagreements. And then we were able up to, to open up the conversation and get to the, the solution, which was them hiring me as a realtor or me teaching that to the right. next student, you know? And, yeah. and I, I look forward to that. I want the disagreement. That's like, right. Because now it's like, okay, now we can have a conversation. Now, now I know you're going to pay attention versus if you agreed, you might be off in la la land in your mind. But if you disagree, you're really going to be paying attention to what I say and looking for holes in my argument. And that to me is, is the basis of having fun and really getting down into the nitty gritty aspects of communication. But, um, you know, we're at a point now where, where logics and conversation, um, has taken the back seat to people's emotional state. And if right. I do anything that ruffles your feathers emotionally, deplatform me and i That's feel right. like we're, we're literally to that point so when we look at the human being psychologically they're getting weakened because now it's not to go to the extreme oh you need to be tough like a warrior no but we need to be able to walk around or listen to something and if we disagree unfollow unlisten and go live our lives not say i disagree with this guy i'm gonna go give him false google reviews i'm gonna call his employer right because i mean it, it's literally gotten to that point where Absolutely. now individuals will hesitate even saying anything yep because they're like man they they will come after me like and and it's like you mentioned earlier it's the people sitting in their mom's basement at home that have nothing better to do and they they feel like now oh i'm i'm in mommy's basement but i have power now i can cancel people it's just it's insane Yep. Hi hiding behind the computer. I got all the power in the world. Yeah. You and I see so many things uh, similarly. So let's talk about what, what, is, what does your business, what does the team look like these days? And then I want to kind of get into maybe some of your future plans and some of the goals for, for next year. So what is Team BC? Not, not the network, but like yeah. just Team BC. What, what does that look like? Cool. Yeah. So initially I started Team BC uh, locally in LA and we were never really past um, one assistant, uh, TC, and probably three, three or four agents. I think, I think that was the max size that we got. And we did pretty well. Uh, but I don't think even with that team, we ever really collectively got much higher than like 100 and 120 deals. Uh, but we were very profitable because I hardly spent any money on marketing. It was almost 100% prospecting based. Absolutely. So our profit margins were, were huge. Um, as I went nationwide, uh, I think June of 2020, I went nationwide. It changed a little bit because what i did was i created this overarching structure where i have regional leaders and then i have I, I trickle it down into the states so as we've been growing i have the regional leader and they'll take over a whole region so i have like northeast southeast uh the west coast right now and really what i'm missing is kind of that midwest like where you're at right because i don't have many members in that middle part of the u.s map so right now we're concentrated more on the east and the west coast but i have regional leadership state leadership and city leadership where i have members and what I did was, is I just created like a, a tremendous platform, kind of like you brought up earlier, where we're Zooming every day. We have uh, trainings pretty much every day, accountability meetings every morning. Um, we do different trainings and check-ins. We have weekly masterminds. And it, it's really designed for somebody to come in. And even if they're like Alejandra, I have her, she's in Las Vegas. She's alone in Vegas right now and my only representative in Nevada, but she's able to plug in with us every day. So I have an overarching structure. I myself am pretty much out of the day to day. Um, I'll do a few appointments here and there, mostly luxury. Like last year, we sold a house in Georgia. So I flew out uh, to that listing appointment in Atlanta and that was like a $2 million home um, on like eight acres. I took that listing and then I handed it off to my local rep, Roberto. So cool. And he, yeah, he put it on the MLS. I gave them the lion's share of the deal yeah. and then they, they just did it, you know? Um, so I'm taking a small cut from all the transactions, but I'm virtually the CEO at this point and I just provide all the structure. I provide the training and I, I do what I can. So when I look at these types of models like real, it makes even more sense because if I ran my own brokerage, I'm going to have to get my license in all these states. Exactly. And I think we're in, we're in 14 states now. I can't do that. It's just logistically yeah. it would be a nightmare. Yeah, I, I love that model. Yeah. I mean, it's so similar to, you know, again, when I was thinking about doing mm -hmm. something like that, as it's very similar to how you structured it. And it just really opens up the opportunity uh, for, for someone like yourself to to grow something special because you do have a lot to bring to your team members. What What is your, so is Loida your partner or how, how does that dynamic work? Do you guys have the business together or what? what is that relationship like? Well, you know, Lloyd and I have been together for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I originally kind of almost sold her on to getting into real estate because she took the traditional route. She uh, ended up getting a job out of college, I think at Herbalife, and she worked in downtown LA. 
And I told her, I was like, you know, I'm not doing that well right now, but there's, I already see the tremendous upside in real estate and I know I'm going to kill it. It's just a matter of time. So get your license. And I think within a month after that, um, she was getting her master's and working. She ended up uh, leaving her job, quitting the master's program. And then she just kind of shadowed me for a while. So I still own the business a hundred percent, but she's like my right hand man in quotes at this point. Uh, and she helps a lot with the training. Uh, she does a lot in regards Makes to helping sense. with the team. She helps me train yeah. the new agents. She's phenomenal when it comes to the techie stuff. And I'm, I'm horrible with the techie yeah, stuff, man. Like, me too. I can shoot the video, but right. I'll just give it to my video guy and her and say like, you guys take care of it. You do the emails, like all that stuff. I don't want to touch. And she's just phenomenal with that. And she's helped me tremendously with that. Um, you know, putting together uh, event pages, like logistically hiring people. Like we just brought on here in Miami, finally, like a full-time in-person uh, assistant admin. She helped locate that individual. You know, she did the interview process. So she's just been integral in the, especially the logistics aspect of the business. She's just so much more techie and systems oriented than me. I'm just kind of the workhorse and I'm the, you know, the producer. Yeah, well, that's great. It's a good dynamic to have you as the visionary out there as the leader and then have her as the operator. It makes up for yeah. a great, great business dynamic. What's life like for you guys in Miami versus LA? Give us the the ups and downs. Give us the behind the scenes Miami life. So a couple of things, right? Number one, I did notice that it's funny in Miami. It almost seems like the average person doesn't want to work. Mm. So I noticed this a long time ago. I mean, everybody's in vacation mode out here. That's so what I hear about up. LA. I hear about yeah, no yeah. one wants to work in LA either. Yeah, I mean, maybe now, right? But I think the mentality in LA is different. Maybe because LA is okay. a lot more street, you know? Yeah. And and Miami's more like, hey, you know, we're gonna go to South Beach. We're just gonna have a drink, go to the beach, and chill. Sure. So I looked at it as an opportunity because I said I don't have that mentality. I can come in here and kill it. Like even when I moved, getting somebody to come to my home. And, and, and potentially uh, do an inspection for upgrades or something. I had to call like five people to get somebody to show up, right? The first Crazy. three people didn't answer their phone. They never called me back. The fourth guy's like, yeah, I'll be right over. He never showed up. So I was like, man, what's going on here? But I said, okay, there's an opportunity there if we work hard. Uh, that's the first one, right? Is that mentality is different. Number two, people generally in Miami, in my experience, every time I visited and now living here a year and a half, people are in a way better mood and happier here in Miami. Uh, compared to LA. Now, I know people will interject and say, no, I've been to Miami. Everybody's an asshole. I'm like, it must be you, dude. Because when I come out here, every, like my neighbors, when I moved in, were like, hey, like hmm. openly talking to me. I was like, man, I've never experienced that. Maybe it's like a Southern thing. I don't yeah. know. Um, but that for sure. Uh, number three, since I've moved here in the last year and a half, when I first moved, rental prices and home prices were less than half of LA. Man, they've jumped up a lot. Rents, mm -hmm. I think year over year here have gone up like 20, 25%. Kind of crazy. Crazy. But overall, I would still say for being a big city in quotes, Miami is still a lot more, in my eyes, much more affordable to somebody coming in wanting to live in a big city compared to compared to LA. Okay. Um, the weather, I love the humidity. A lot of people don't. I love it. I think it's amazing. It makes my hair look super cool. Um, but other than that, man, um, I think the opportunities are still there for people. But just overall, I feel like nobody's walking around here judging me. And in L.A., I felt like, man, I'm the black sheep in L.A. Everywhere I go, everyone just looks at me funny, hmm. um, is completely opposed to my beliefs. Again, that was just my experience. And sure. I felt like over there, they'll openly say something to you or judge you for it and kind of ridicule you versus here. Everyone just does their own thing. Everybody minds their own business and everybody has a smile on their face. So to me, that's priceless because could I still do my thing in LA? Sure. But being at a different vibe out here, um, it makes things different, man. Cause I, I was always happy and fulfilled, but now even more than ever, you know, I have more, more ability now to connect with people here in Miami. And I've been making so many connections. It's, it's just amazing because I'll go out a lot of times and people will approach me. And I'm yeah. not used to that. I'm not used to people openly coming up to me and talking to me like constantly. And it just blew my mind when I moved out here last May, that first month that I was here. And when I moved, I had nothing. All my stuff was in storage. I was house shopping. I was in a little like 500 square foot apartment uh, in Miami Beach. I was like, man, this is cool. I'm in monk mode. I don't have anything. Love it. And I'm just out here as a new person exploring, right? I don't know anybody. I'm here by myself. And I took so much joy and excitement out of that that it was just this unique like life experience that I would recommend to people. Go somewhere where you've never been, even if you're not going to move, and just be there for a month with nothing. 
and go so out there cool. and experience it, you know? And it was just amazing because I met so many people. I made so many connections that, I mean, I'll just carry that the rest of my life. So you didn't have any friends or network there? Like you built it all, like you built all new relationships down there? I mean, I knew people through social media, sure. Sure, sure, but yeah. It, it was almost like no, no family, no family, no tight, no, no. tight, tight friends there? No, nothing. That's so cool. So I, I, I relished in that challenge aspect. Like I'm, it's like, yeah, I have money, you know, I'm in a different position, but I'm starting from ground zero. This is cool. So cool. This is That's like, so in cool. quote, starting over again, but not. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it, man. And, you know, like the I did my first coaching event there a couple months later. I already had a venue, a great relationship with one of the Amazing. business owners. And it was like a rooftop place in Miami Beach. That's badass. So I told them, I was like, all the stuff I've been telling you guys, you're seeing now being executed with me moving across the country to a new place where I know nobody. And look, we have the business owner here present at the event. They're one of the speakers at the event. And we have this beautiful venue, right? So and cool. this wasn't done through social media. This was done through me meeting them on the street. So all the stuff I've been teaching you guys in application, you see the result, you know? Yeah. Last one for me, dude. This has been great, by the way. I love the conversation. If, you know, on a Saturday, you you don't have work going on, you're not making any videos, what is life like? Like, what, what do you do? What are some of the hobbies? Uh, do you wake up early? Do you hit the beach? Do you go out at night? Do you, what does that look like on a Saturday? Man, there, there's a lot. So much of what I do, and it's a great question because so much of what I do in regards to content creation and building the businesses has literally been ingrained in my soul where I enjoy it. That I don't even look at that as work anymore. Like it's fun. Same. Exact same, um, same, same thing. Yeah. So I'll still go to the office. Like one thing I've been working on and I haven't finished them. And this is the one thing I can say that I haven't stuck to my word on through social media is I promised people last year I'd be done with my first book. Um, I'm simultaneously writing three right now. And like I'm, I'm chipping together all of them. So, so hard. that will be done soon. That I'm doing on the weekends for sure because I have a little bit more time to me to do it and sit down for an hour or two and type and, and, and do it. Um, but I've always been a, a physical prowess guy, man. Like I love doing the calisthenics and gymnastics workouts and I've been doing that a lot. I do that a lot on the weekends. We do like two or three hour workouts with my trainer because I really want to get to doing that advanced stuff, you know, that you sure. look at and like the Olympics where they're like Absolutely. hanging off the arms. I love it. Um, I'm still playing some basketball. Cool. Um, you know, I'm out there walking, going to the beach, like just doing physical stuff and being outside. You know, and sometimes even at my house, if I'm going to read, I'll go outside in my front yard under the sun and sit outside there for 30 minutes or an hour with my book and just read. So, you know, cool. so I like reading. I like being out, walking, being at the park, working out. Like that, that's the vast majority of my free time. If I don't have anything on the calendar, is that. And I'll at the park, I meet people all the time. Like, I think every time I go to the park, I meet one or two new people and like we exchange Instagrams or we start talking and I tell people, it's not like I'm out there, oh, I need a network. It's just, that's become a part of me and that's what yeah. I do. And, and that alone will help you build your social media and your business. I just think people don't really see that for what it is. And all it is, is just creating connections with people. And innately, as you become more free and confident in yourself, you'll naturally just do that. Cause when you're happy, you're winning, you're smiling, life is good. You're going to want to talk to people and it's normal, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, to actually conversate with other human beings. That's right. And I've just been do i been doing that more and more. And it, it's amazing, man. It really is amazing because you meet more people and you get to experience more out of life versus just, hey, I'm going to sit here and browse on my phone and watch other people live their lives, you know? Yeah. And, and, I've, and, and I've experienced the exact same things when I stopped really going out and, and you know, I got a family, I got three, three daughters and when I stop drinking alcohol and I stop going out and I start really getting to, into into physical fitness, you start to meet, I don't know if I would call it better, but but very interesting characters that are into life, into living life, you know, and, and to your point, it's like you meet really cool people that are doing things like that, um, that, that truly can impact your life. And so, Listen, man, I've really enjoyed this a lot. And I want to thank you for coming on and, and sharing this and being vulnerable and being open. Uh, mad respect for you. All the best uh, for you at Real. I think you're going to do amazing things. I think the leadership over uh, team over there is incredible. And I think it was a great move. So thank you very, very much. No, I appreciate you for, uh, appreciate you for having me, man. I, uh, I've really, even though I didn't do it before, I've started to interview people on my podcast so I can get you on mine too. Um, absolutely. absolutely man. but this is fun dude because it's rare to get on here and just kind of you know 
shoot the shit like this because yep. you know most people want to talk specifically about one thing or right. they want to avoid this conversation entirely because they don't want to flirt that that boundary like oh i don't want to get into anything that could potentially <laughs> get, let me catch heat yeah. so and, and and it goes to show that we can have a civil conversation about this stuff and 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 talk about it because this yeah. is happening and a lot of people you know, just, I guess they're oblivious to it because they don't see my stuff anymore. They think maybe I rode off into the sunset or, you know, it was something different, but nah, man, it's just like, we're, we're fighting the the beast in a way. Yeah. And I, people, I don't think they really realize how even, um, we can say deeply rooted this is. You oh, know? there's no and, doubt. And, there's no doubt. And, and maybe on a separate call, I can specifically go over all the stuff that's happened to me. So you have in the audience, if sure. you know, they want to hear it specifically what happened to me, what they kicked me off, what was demonetized just so people know the the how extensive this was and how the operation went down because hmm. you know when i was watching it unfold i said man this is it's hmm. genius the way that they're doing it i like i have to give them credit simultaneously to being upset because they're really doing a masterful job like as an example there would be one point where you would i would see this live people would look me up on instagram and you could not pull up my profile hmm. you could not pull it up like they would type in my full wow. name and scroll all the way through. And it was like this for a good six months to a year. And you could not find me. You could not tag me. I mean, mm. I was just like, wow, how do they do that? That's amazing. That's incredible. Because you know? yeah, you, yeah, you're hearing not... more and more about these these people yeah. that are just getting deplatformed. And you and they they tell stories like you're saying. It's like, yeah. man, it's incredible how how yeah. powerful it is. And so it's pretty crazy. Yeah. We'll have to maybe unpack that in another conversation, but For sure. appreciate For sure. you do very, very much. Let's do Thanks, this again. Man. Love to be back on Absolutely. your show. Let's do it, bro.